But that gave legitimacy to the whole market. And suddenly, VCs here in Europe were looking for, well, who's the European equivalent? And they kind of found us. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. We are the Startup Fan, and this is our brand new chat show, Behind the Curtain, brought to you in association with WeWork. Behind the Curtain is a secret chat show that nobody knows who's behind this curtain. Literally nobody until we open it, right? We're doing 10 of these shows across London, Manchester, and of course, our hometown, Dublin. We're taking it home. We're taking yes, it we home are. for two yes, episodes. This is the first one we've ever done in front of a live studio audience, so thank everyone for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> we, we could not do this without sponsors, right? So we'd like to take a little bit of time to thank our sponsors, Jobio, and also thank our sponsors, Smith & Williamson. So thank Woo! you, guys. Thanks, guys. So, Who's behind the curtain? We've had some guesses, all wrong. Pretty much every single one of them was wrong, apart from one that nearly... Nearly ruined the show. We nearly had to stop the show, because yeah. someone actually got it right. It's a really awkward situation. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll explain when they come out. Probably uh, no point in asking people to guess if they're going to guess it right. That's where, yeah, actually, we need to rethink yeah, things. probably not. So basically, our first entrepreneur tonight is an Irish entrepreneur who sold our company in 2015 for 28 million pounds. Our Whoa, take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Our second guest is an Australian who came all the way over for this show. <laughs> Full of Australians. Came all the way over for the show. He's got over 2 million users on his platform, right? And he actually came up with the idea for his business in the back of a frozen chicken truck. That was one of the guesses, was Colonel Sanders from KFC. It's, it's not, not him. It's not, it's not him. Sorry, this point. There's no Couldn't free chicken. Couldn't get a cartoon character on the show. Yeah. We tried, we did try. Yeah, we did try our best. But guys, who was behind the curtain? Give me a huge round of applause from Hassle.com co-founder Jules Coleman and our second guest, Tim Fung from Airtasker. Woo! <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. Up on the couch. Up on the couch. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for coming. You know, I know you guys have been sitting there for at least 10 or 15 minutes. What everyone here is kind of going, who's behind the curtain? 10 or 15 <laughs> hours. Yeah. Thank you so much. Day. This is the first show, as we said, we're doing um, across London, Manchester, and, and Dublin, right? So thank you for taking out the time. I know you didn't come all the way over from Australia. Yeah, we lied. Yes. We lied about that. Yeah, but it, it, it did sound good. It, it did awesome. sound good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, Jules. Yes. You sold your company, Hassel. Indeed. A couple of years ago, which was an online, uh, sorry, cleaning on demand company, yep. Yep. right? And Tim, you have an everything on demand company. <laughs> so we thought this would be good to get the two of you on the show at the same time. So we're going to go back to you, Jules. Yeah. All right. You started off like Tim did. Yeah. With everything on demand. Everything. That and was it. Yeah. And then you went, right, okay, everything's changing. We're going to call it hassle.com and we're going to look at cleaning only. Why? Because we spent about 18 months of that time really spinning our wheels, getting every investor and person we met with, guys, you just need to focus. You're trying to do like everything, and there's like three of you, and you've never run a business, and you don't know what you're doing. Would it maybe be easier to do one thing and kind of try to do that well? And we're like, no, no, no. You see, the thing is that we do everything. That's what makes us who we are. Yeah. Um, but after about 18 months, finally, for some of the studying statistics at Maths University, I decided to look at the data, look at the numbers, and we found that most people come to our website, we're looking for cleaners, and we didn't have any, because they were hard to find, and we're like, ah, that might be an idea, there might be something in that. So yeah. over the Christmas of 2012, we completely shelved everything we'd worked on for 18 months, rebuilt the website, said, what would a website that you only booked a cleaner look like? How would that be? What would that look yeah, like? Yeah. Uh, relaunched 1st of January 2013, and kind of, yeah, got going from there. I'm going to go back to when you actually named your company as well, right? Yeah. Because it didn't start off as Hassle.com. No, it was called Teddle after my dog Ted. After your dog. Yeah. Were you yeah. just sitting there one day and your dog was there and was like, that's just easier to pick the dog's Yeah, name. literally, I was coming up with domain names. So I was like, Razzle, Jazzle, Frazzle, Teddle. <laughs> Teddle, that could be a yeah. thing. Kind of like, looks a little bit like Google, as yeah, like a kind yeah. of, you know, word construct. Was £6.50 on uh, GoDaddy, <laughs> I believe. And I was like, yeah, that'll do. And then we spent the next two years trying to spell it to people over the phone. And they're like, Pedal? Tattle? What, what, what the hell are you? Um, and then we learned the power of brand uh, yeah. by, by rebranding to something. Was it really awkward possible. saying your company name and a dog come over every two yeah, seconds yeah. and say, no, no. <laughs> Hello, um, Tattle. <laughs> <laughs> but you um, also had a, a funny uh, experience about your, the name of uh, Airtasker. 
named yeah. after a Marvel hero. Yeah, so we, we wanted to make uh, being an air tusker like a super aspirational thing. And so, yeah, pretty nerdy. We found out that there was like a, a Marvel character which was called Air Walker. And we're like, ah, oh, well, he walks on air, so uh, we're doing tasks. Why so not? Air tasks, nice. Why not? You guys talk to pretty different roots. You know, obviously, you, you stick with doing everything, and yep. you, went, you zoned in on, <laughs> on cleaning. And then you could have went the Series B route, mm -hmm. um, which may could have been an obvious route for people, and you went the route of, of obviously high level high level funding. What was that? How did you make the decision first of all? Because it was something I always wanted to ask you. So how did you make the decision of not going for Series B? You said yourself you could have raised twenty million. Yeah, yeah, that was a really tricky one. Um, so I had two co-founders at Hassel, and we'd raised our Series A in twenty fourteen from Axel Partners here in London. Raised six million dollars as a team of five people, and kind of looked at this pile of cash and go, like, uh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but about a year later, we were in the position of looking at raising our next round, and yeah, we went out um, and we started raising a Series B of like fifteen to twenty million uh, at that time. Um, and at the very same time, completely unsolicited, we started getting uh, uh, offers of somebody who wanted to acquire us. Um, and it was really, really tough. You know, you started this company, and it started mm. in my bedroom, and I was like, I wasn't really ready to get rid of it and sell it. And I had this route where I could keep going. But at the same time, once you take on venture capital funding, you know that this isn't a business that you're building to give down to your grandchildren. Mm. Like, that's not it. Yeah. It's not like, you know, Jules Coleman and family, <laughs> kind of like, you know, uh, could above have been. the door. Could have, <laughs> could, could have been. But, and so you have to start making, like, slightly less sentimental and emotional decisions and just saying, well, like, is, if we take in 20 million, like, dollars and our company is valued at, let's say, 100 million, mm. then somebody needs to come along and want to pay 150 for this to still be a good deal for kind of me. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that, but it was, like, a super tricky... Uh, period of time and, and that was probably some of the most fraught like that we'd been as a co-founding team trying to decide what the best path forward was because it was irreversible you know depending on what you did absolutely and, yeah. and sorry go on. Tim you raised 33 million dollars I believe. yeah 35 million dollars uh, last year sorry What's two million between <laughs> friends anyway? Huh? Well, well, I wasn't trying to like. Uh, uh, we had you. him on the roundup. I know, I know. Yeah. Get it right, you idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Who gave you the notes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark wrote these. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like raising that much money and that much capital? Did you have an option to exit? Was that a th ever go through your mind? Yeah, so we're definitely going through some, um, some pretty serious growth. So um, we actually had a lot of our existing investors come into that round again and just support mm. us again. And a couple of new investors um, come in too. Um, but definitely what we're building out is a community. Um, yeah. It takes a lot of investment, takes a lot of time to build out um, a community product. Um, and we're going to be here for a long haul, keeping on doing that. I know there's a, a number of entrepreneurs here that are in the middle of raising money as well, right? And anytime we're ever talking about raising money on the roundup, we're always talking about smart money. Mm. You know, that it's not just a case of going down to the bank and going, oh, I need six million. You know, there's oh, a check. Nice. Yeah, it would be nice. Right, <laughs> but going, there's six million, now you, you need to start paying back a certain amount each month, right? You get nothing with your money but a headache, right? So we've always talked about smart money, that if you're going to raise six money for hassle.com, you want to raise it from someone who either knows your industry mm -hmm. or has, has interest in your industry that can bring something to the table, right? And we talked before on the show about raising money, where you raise money, right? And it was real, smart money isn't always like the ideal way to go because you're bringing people on that are going to go, right, what you need to do is this, 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 and this. You're, you mm. don't really get the company at all, pal. Yeah, I think you want to um, combine it. So mm. it's great to have some smart people and bring them on the journey. And I think that's really important if you can get some smart people on your board or like to be advisors to the company and stuff mm. like that. Um, but you definitely don't need every single dollar that's coming in the door to be smart money. And in yeah, fact, yeah. Um, that's probably not a good idea because by the end of it, you end up with a cap table of 40 people who all think that they know um, the right way to go. Um, so I think you actually want to combine that. You want to have some smart people, but you want some other people who just, yeah, I just give the money and, and I support by um, staying out of it. Absolutely. And just going back to the, the acquisition of Hassle.com, you knew the people mm -hmm. from Helpling who, yeah. who actually acquired the company. How did that relation, because you obviously would be, end up competing with them more than likely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, and it's a really odd one, right? Is mm. When you have that kind of trade sales sort of scenario, because people go from being your competitor uh, to people, people you're negotiating with to being your, you know, you know, co-founder sort of kind of mm. idea. And that's a really tricky thing to, you know, pass because even at the size of the deal we were doing, you don't have an army of lawyers and kind of like, you know, advisors and stuff yeah, doing yeah. that. It was us sitting at the negotiating table with each other talking about like tax Will warranties. Like, you know, and like <laughs> yeah. really boring stuff like that. Really boring stuff that could land you in jail or like lose all your money in <laughs> yeah. seven years. Jail, like, that you know, stuff. Yeah. 
yeah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's a really tricky transition to kind of make, you know, going from industry competitors to, you know, not adversaries, but on the opposite side of the negotiating table to being mm. around the same table trying to make the same company successful. It, it's an interesting one, though, with the company that bought you guys, right? Because you launched in, what, 2011, yeah. 2012? Right? Yeah, it's 2011, yeah. 2011, yeah. right? So the company that bought you launched in 2014. Yep. Right, yep. so they launched a couple of years after you, but they just raised more money than you guys did. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so we were lucky. So we raised in at the very start of 2014, and honestly, we exceeded our wildest expectations as to what we could raise the company. When we started, when we pivoted to doing cleaning only, like I think Alex, my co-founder, held kind of a sort of like memorial for our ever raising funding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's like, who's going to put money into a cleaning company? Like really, a cleaning mm. company? And uh, and we thought like, well, it's like the least sexy tech ever. Like VCs off the radar. Um, but then these things like come in waves and cycles. An American competitor who had got started just after us, uh, Homejoy, uh, graduated from Y Combinator and literally off the back of Demo Day raised 40 million, which for us was wow. just like, what? <laughs> like 40 for a cleaning company? Um, but that gave legitimacy to the whole market and suddenly VCs here in Europe were looking for, well, who's the European equivalent? And they kind of found us. Of course. Yeah. And, and how long did you, obviously when the acquisition took place, how long did you did you last in, in the new company? So I stayed for just about six months kind of post-transition. And I think it was a real learning curve you know, for that, making that transition from being the founder of your own company to mm. being effectively an employee in a larger company. Yeah. You know, and, and you still got the goal that you want the company to be successful. Um, but you had a team of people here in London who looked up to us as being the founders and kind of like the old kind of like, you know, powerful kind of people. And then and suddenly we weren't. And, mm. and that's like, it's was tricky that weird? to navigate. Yeah, sure, mm. it was tricky. And I think we kind of come to terms with in the deal. And we, were, we went into it very much with our eyes open that if we yeah. sell the company, we sold the company. It's not, we can't sell it and claim it's still ours. And <laughs> yeah, kind of, you know, yeah. do stuff. It doesn't yeah. work um, that way. <laughs> but in, in practice, that's, it's, it's hard when it's the thing that, you know, I, so I'm the CTO, I write lines of code, and I'm like, well, I, I remember when I wrote the first line. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, like yeah. you're like, all yeah, of this yeah, was yeah. kind of us. So, Someone comes yeah. in and changes all Yeah, um, but of course, that's what you kind of, you're in business to do. Again, if if you want to have a business that you, you know, hold on to for generations, and like I say, pass down, then yeah. don't go the VC route. That's not compatible with yeah. that idea. Tim, we had a joke at the beginning saying that you were here for this show. You're not only here for this show, are you? No, we're here because uh, we launched Air Tasker in, in London um, about nine days ago. Congratulations, by the way. So we're nine days old. Woo! Air Tasker. Actually, <laughs> just so as you know, do you know who poured your drink tonight? Uh, an Air Tasker. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. We actually put up a job on Air Tasker. There he is in the background. Right, and he applied. Said so we said we were looking for a barman for the event that we were doing. Someone applied, and we took him on board, of course. We can. So I, I guess you can see that we went completely the opposite route of yeah. um, not just focusing on cleaning, but we went the other way, where you can find a bartender or you can find some other yeah. um, people for random. Stuff Absolutely. Too. How has obviously you're mega successful in Australia, crazy successful. You're just so fresh in, in, in the UK. What's it been like? Is that any more of a challenge than, the, than Australia? Well, it's, it's really, really awesome because we've gone all the way back, I guess, to the beginning of starting a startup. And um, it's been really, really humbling to go back and do all those same things that we had to do again in Australia. But I guess yeah. we're coming into it with a bit more knowledge and IP about what worked in Australia and what didn't work yeah. um, in Australia. So we're a little bit smarter than we did last time. Um, but it, essentially, we're starting up a new startup um, out here in the UK, and it's uh, it's you know 24 hours flight away, so it's yeah, a pretty it's, uh, it's a big yeah. commitment. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a big commitment. If I get it wrong, um, it's a lot of flight. <laughs> yeah, 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 big time. <laughs> you, um, we got an email off the off the GM. His name is Lucas London. Did you yeah. make him change yeah. his name? Is that the part <laughs> thing? Sort of. We've tattooed it on his head as well. So um, no, uh, Lucas is um, our, our UK general manager out yeah. here, and um, I guess the most important thing when you're starting up in any countries, you've got to go and find local people who actually know what's yeah, going yeah. on in the local landscape. So um, we spent a lot of time and effort um, coming out to the UK completely by ourselves. Um, and then we, we found Lucas and he's been out leading the charge over here for the last nine months. When you raised money, right, was the plan always to move to the UK or was the plan to grow Australia? Because I know I got my maths right on the roundup when I was saying you had 10% of Australia we're actually using Airtasker. Yeah. Right? So obviously uh, the UK is a much bigger market. Do you still see yourself getting 10% of this market? And I know you were also saying as well that when it came to what was working for the likes of um, Airtasker in Australia, you didn't know what the silver bullet was, right? You knew it didn't work, mm. you knew it did work, but you didn't know what really kind of hit the nail on the head. Are you going to just try everything that you did in Australia here? Are you going to treat the market here the same? Because I know you, when we were talking about Lucas London, right, who we had hired, you weren't going to just hire a lot of Aussies to 
to come over <laughs> here and tell everyone in the UK how to yeah. do it, right? Because mm -hmm. it wouldn't go down well, would it? No, mm -hmm. definitely not. So you're going to see the same, see if it works the same here or try something new? Well, I think we, we've tried a lot of things in Australia. So by process of elimination, we know a crap load about what doesn't work. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. we're masters of what doesn't work and, and what, what will um, spend lots of money and make you a failure. Um, but, uh, uh, but I guess when we're coming out here in the UK, we do have to experiment a lot. It is a, yeah. It's a local market. Um, it's a local community play. Um, I guess one of the cool things about Airtasker, though, is it is um, genuinely all driven by user-generated content, mm. which means that um, we don't kind of say, hey, here's what um, services you can buy, and um, you need to buy X, Y, Z service. We're kind of saying, hey, what do you guys need us to do? Yeah. Um, so it's totally user-driven, so we expect that the vast majority of the content being created by local um, UK or Londoners Absolutely. Um, are, are going to make their own way of using Airtasker. And, and we're really looking forward to some of that um, creative inspiration that we've seen in Australia, like people using Airtasker for all sorts of stuff, which we could like never have imagined. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bartenders, bartenders lots of time, is one, yeah. but you know, in Australia, it's barbecue masters. Um, I guess out here, maybe you've got some <laughs> it's other... It's too cold. Yeah. <laughs> the snow <laughs> is way too cold <laughs> you don't need the model, yeah. What do you think, by the way? Because you obviously started off in the same position that, that Tim was in, right? So. It, was it or was it not working? What, what way was it going? Because I know Alex, yep. the other co-founder, yep. three co-founders. Yeah, yeah, Alex and Tom. And Tom, that Alex was on borderline going home. Oh yeah, yeah. She's like she came. So myself and Tom, who were the technical co-founders, and Alex was the help me turn on my computer co-founder, <laughs> like right. on the other end, but <laughs> very good at a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And she was out like schlepping around London trying to raise a, a round, like our angel round. I'm finding it really hard going because like. You, you guys all know, like, you don't typically get no's from investors, you just get apathy of like, yeah, yeah, mm. may, maybe, maybe, like sometime in the future. Um, and it was just really hard going for her. Um, and my son and Tom had the satisfaction that every day we'd write lines of code, we'd make a new feature, we'd yeah. make something better, we mm. could like squint really hard at some metrics and see something going up and to the right if we really like tried hard. <laughs> yeah. um, and she was just like, this, this isn't what we left our jobs for. Like we mm. all have like, you know, partners and houses and kids and it was yeah, like, yeah. we're not here playing house, like what is it? Um, and like we were so thankful for like for bringing it to a head because me and Tom probably would have just kept building stuff, yeah. hoping that it would just get better. Um, and you were kind of you know we were perfecting around a local maximum that was not very high. I guess yeah. it was quite low. And, and and it was that kind of jolt that kind of made us reconsider everything. Are you trying to panic Tim here? Or no, or? I think like some <laughs> and Tim were talking like before the show, and I, I think. The, actually, the, the two ends of the spectrum that we're on are both in terms of breadth of services, but also the kind of control or kind of you know marketplace aspect. So we were really trying to disrupt the cleaning agency model. We saw like the old-fashioned uh, traditional cleaning agency basically ripped off the customer and the cleaner, mm -hmm. and they never they were greedy on the individual transactions, so yeah. they never got big in size, and they had no technology. And we thought you can do an agency better. And I think what Tim and the guys at Airtask are doing are, are you know modernizing a marketplace, a much broader kind of marketplace, and allowing people to set their own terms. And and conditions, and I think that works with breadth and scale. For us, you know, if we wanted to really control the experience, you have to go narrower. Trying to control the experience across 27 things yeah. was just impossible. Yeah. It didn't yeah. work. It's um, the most important thing, obviously, is letting is awareness and getting mm -hmm. people to know. You have a pretty ag aggressive marketing campaign in Australia. I think we've seen the ads. You could probably get an ad up now. I don't know if we can if we can get it up. But um, is your plan to do that to do that here? TV advertising obviously is quite expensive, but it's worked for you in Australia. Yeah, so I think that definitely getting um, getting the word out there is important. But I think uh, with Airtasker, it's like a demand-driven marketplace. So we literally have to like inspire people on how they're going to use our platform mm. and, and what they're going to use it for. Um, so one of the biggest things we do is we uh, we consider ourselves to be like a content uh, website. So every time okay. like a job is created on Airtasker, it's actually a little piece of content which provides mm. like social proof for people to see, oh wow, there's actually people using it for X, Y, Z. Yeah. And also provides inspiration for people to go, oh, if you can use it for a bartender, maybe you could use it to hire mm. an actor in a, in a short movie that I'm going to make or someone to write a poem for me or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so really like one of the biggest ways that we want to build awareness out here is by just showing Casing how people are, are using Airtasker in the real world. Are you telling me I can make money from writing my poems? Absolutely. <laughs> like <laughs> check out the, the check out the platform now. Like we get yeah. people are, are making money doing all sorts of like really really interesting stuff. Like you know, um, everything from you know going down into a vertical and being like an expert cleaner or an expert painter. Yeah. We've got like people earning like more than a full time income doing those things. Um, we've also got people out there who are just um, you know monetizing like unique skills they might have, like um, being able to make a Halloween costume or like being able to like crochet a jumper. 
Yeah. Um, and right now, not all of those industries are necessarily things where you can make a full-time living just mm. doing that one specialty. Uh, but that's actually what makes the community kind of vibrant, is like you're always finding um, different things to do and make money from. You told us that there's actually always, nearly every single day, there's a job that comes up that either someone's looking for or someone's posting or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. That you're kind of going, oh my God, what the <laughs> hell is this, right? You mentioned a couple of them when you were on the roundup. Have yeah. there any been, or has there been any other crazy stories that you've kind of gone, get that down? We yeah. have to get that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any dodgy ones? Well, yeah, yeah. Look, our um, one that we put up the other night. Yeah. yeah. Don't well, ask. No, no, we didn't Don't take ask. that down. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's kind of cool. Um, no, I mean we're seeing like something like five thousand jobs a day going through the platform. So there's 5, kind of crack stuff mm -hmm. uh, going up almost every single, um, almost every single day. So yeah. it's kind of everything from um, creative stuff. Um, to, to some really nice philanthropic stuff, which we've seen. Um, we saw a really cool one in Sydney where someone posted up a job to say, um, I want you to go and feed a homeless person and then like yeah. take a photo oh, that's cool. um, with the homeless person. And, and the cool thing is, because it's like an open community-based platform, people could like copy that task. And so we saw heaps of people copying that task and go, oh, I want you to feed a homeless person too. So like literally, I'm um, going to do it somewhere else and take another selfie. And yeah. so we ended up with all these selfies of people um, feeding homeless people. So that's really, um, good. really it's kind of like, it, it's up to like uh, the people, the users inside the community to come up with how they're going to use their task. And, and that's what's super, super exciting because we're not telling them what they can get done. Yeah. They're telling us what they yeah. need to get done. Absolutely. Uh, Jules, you're on your second baby. I know. Yeah. Resi. Yep. A lot of people would look at you now and go, God, you're lucky because you exited your first company and now you're starting your second one. That must be easy. God, you're lucky. That's what we were thinking of. But uh, what's it been like? With, with, what's it been like with Resi? Is it less pressure? Is it easier? Uh -huh. When we were before we kind of settled on doing Resi, we, we had the codenamed our difficult second album because that's kind of what it felt yeah. like. That you know we like we had this like one hit wonder of sorts and like mm. could we do it again? Was that a complete fluke? Like was there anything of what we did that really made that successful or were we just like you know like lucky with our timing? Um, and so yeah, it definitely was hard. And I think. We tried the kind of um, scientific approach for a time, like coming up with loads of business ideas. I'd read The Economist, and I'm like, "Oh, that looks like an interesting area yeah. of like, you know, the Oh, I'll copy that idea, um, yeah. And, <laughs> and we, had, like, you know, we had like a long list of ideas, and myself and Alex were trying to force ourselves to even research them, and it just wasn't happening. Like, mm. you know, and, it didn't, yeah. and that wasn't how Hustle had come about. Hustle had been a very organic problem for myself. Like, it really, it, it morphed. Like, actually, the problem that I initially had was I was trying to find a piano teacher in Clapham. So to run a cleaning <laughs> business, like, <laughs> is a bit of a stretch, but it was the genesis of the idea. And then, ultimately, Resi came from, again, like, a, a, a problem that we were kind of experiencing in our own lives. So, Alex, after we left Hustle, we had six months off. I got a puppy and played tennis. That was like my nice. six months. It was good. Good six Way months. Way to blow your money. And uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That puppy's yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but Alex thought, oh, I'll just do this like really small little extension on my house in like Streatham, <laughs> like just like a really tiny little extension of the kitchen. It'll be easy. I'll be off. Like you know, she had a she had a baby, and she was like, it'll be, it'll be great. It's great. Like a year and a half later, she was still trying to finish this bloody extension, and like her house was in a complete disarray. Um, but in the process, she'd met these two young architects that were based out of Tower Bridge, and they'd spent the last 10 years building up a traditional architecture practice. Mm. And they, they'd done really well for themselves. There were about 20 people now, kind of, you know, growing it in London. But they kind of felt they'd reached kind of the kind of plateau where that was going to get to. Um, I was looking for a house to buy, and I kind of wanted something with development of potential. And I was like, well, I can't drag an architect around every time I want to go do a viewing on Rightmove. Yeah. Like, I'm just trying to guess. Well, you could have, of course. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. right? Like, it didn't really seem like a thing. And, and so the four of us got together and started thinking. Like, and, and just we were applying what we learned from Hassel, and the, like my mind was, was like quickly going to the tech I could build to support this, because like tech for them was emails and maybe a spreadsheet. Like that was it. Mm, yeah. um, and really quickly, we were like there's something here. Like, and I literally went back to the desk, started writing like an MVP and we launched it within a week. And then within a month, they left their like practice, they put a manager in and the four of us are working on it full time. And so it was that organic thing again that kind of got us going. Incredible. Um, and I think, yeah, trying to be really methodical about it, at least for us, wasn't yeah. the approach that would work. Did, did you think when you sold the company, did you think that's it, I'm retired? Or did you straight away kind of go, I'll buy that puppy, yeah. Um, I'll walk him I got tennis ground. elbow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I mean, you get tennis elbow actually for about three weeks. So <laughs> that was a real thing. Um, no, I mean, I think we, we always knew, like, we, we'd been really lucky, kind of, you know, with the financial kind of outcome of that. But, it, you know, it's it was never going to be like a now we're retired. I was like 
29, I guess. Yeah, like right. just turning 30. I wasn't going to ask your age, by the way. Yeah, um, and it was like, that's not really, yeah. Thing. Good like, age people, to retire. People, yeah, people, people, people like just getting started with their careers, and I'm just getting started as well. Yeah. Like, it's not a time to think about doing that. And, you know, my husband, he works at Startup here in London. He was working at Delivery. He'd be an early employee there. Like, they're going gangbusters and stuff. And it was like... What's that, the company? Yeah, I don't know. You might have heard of it. It's like try a takeaway kind of thing. Delivery. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, no. yeah, no, no. Maybe um, they'd be gas for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, what am I going to do? Is, like, sit at home all day? Like, that's pretty boring. Yeah, yeah. Um, Throwing money in there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. God. And a puppy. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but I felt incredibly unemployable. I'm like, well, because like, before startup, I'd been a management consultant mm. um, making PowerPoint slides for a living, basically. Exciting. And I thought... I'm yeah. not doing that again. Um, but also, I, I'm probably just really unemployable now. Like, I've run a company. Like, I'm not sure I can just slink into employee mode. Mm. Um, so I didn't really know. And then I got a lifeline with that an investor that I knew here in London, uh, Martin Mignot, a partner at Index Ventures, said, hey, why don't you and Alex think about coming and join us at Entrepreneurs in Residence for a time? Yeah. Which is kind of a made-up role uh, that they were really nice made to make up, up for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was that we got to hang out at their office a couple of days a week, see all the companies that they were seeing, provide our insight wherever that might be useful. And for us, it just kind of like showed us like the breadth of kind of different technologies and industries that are out there. We've been heads down in a cleaning company for five years. Mm. And suddenly there was more, t more out there. Can, can I ask just because... We've had mixed reports when it comes to selling your company, right? Mm. Obviously, some people can sell their company, get a lot of money, and happy days, you buy, buy a puppy, whatever you're going to do. Um, some people sell their company, and then they're asked to stay on for a year or two, right? Because I know when my dad sold his company, he was asked to stay on, and he watched the company go from one company who bought him, right, mm -hmm. that were bigger, but weren't necessarily doing it right, where he was doing it right, and that's why they, they, they saw the interest in his company, so bought it. But they asked him to stay on for about five years, I think it was. So he went from owning this company to all of a sudden selling it, which was fine, you know, but he was, wasn't able to retire just yet. And then watch them make the decisions that they made in their previous company, mm -hmm. which was the reason that they weren't working, right, or to the size that they wanted to get to. Was it like that for you? When, when Helping bought you guys, were they making some decisions that you were just like, oh, this is actually hurting me, like this is literally my baby that they're making yeah, decisions like, on? I mean, like we were talking about earlier, I think, you know, there is an element of that, like that it is your baby. And, and, mm, yeah. and, and but, you know, being the grown up adult, like, you know, you sign the contracts, it's no longer yours. Like it really isn't. It's, you know, and, uh, um, you know, I guess it's like renting a house and how many people live there. Like, you, know, you need to live, like, you know, kind of <laughs> yeah, do what yeah. they want to do. It might be how you decorate it, but it doesn't mm. mean that, like, they're doing a bad job. Yeah. Um, and also, it's so easy to cast, like, stones when you're not the one in control and, like, you know, having all these fires going out everywhere. Like, I'm sure there was a lot of backseat kind of, like, you know, drivers, like, when we were running hassle, we're like, well, if only they did it this way. I mean, yeah, they'd yeah. be killing it. That's like, easy you know, to say that, so isn't it? Yeah, do, yeah, right? Yeah. When you just got your bit to focus on and you can just, like, say, well, everything else has been done terribly. So we didn't want to be that person. We didn't want to yeah. be the backseat driver, kind of like just like you know going well I would have done it differently um, and ultimately though we did make the decision after six months that it would be better for us to just let them get on and do it you know in their mm. own way and not have like all the staff in London kind of looking to them but then looking to us like we were divorced yeah, yeah, parents that were kind of like you know like, kind <laughs> yeah, of like yeah, yeah. come to me to McDonald's like, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. Uh, and so um, I think that's natural and sometimes it's a match made in heaven and you know the teams like gel together and it's like a co-founding team that take it on but well, that's the rarity. That's the exception to the rule, I think. Yeah, it's um, funny also when it comes to timing, right? Where timing for Tettle mm -hmm. mightn't have been right at the time. Where Airtasker, this might be the actual prime time mm. for you guys to come from Australia to here, right? Because obviously Jules tried it before, wasn't working for you guys, so they focused on cleaning. And now you guys are coming over, and they could just blow up for you. Yeah, I, I think uh, we were talking before before the show about how like it's just a different approach. Like I think, yeah, um, and, and there's really kind of two kind of approaches you can go down. You can kind of go down the approach of um, being the agency, setting the standards, and trying to nail the quality like through process and stuff like that. Um, and I think absolutely, if you're going to go down that route you really want to focus and be like, we're just going to do one thing because like nailing processes across like lots of different things is going to be virtually impossible. Yeah. Like to yeah. nail a process across a bartender and how you're going to go feed a homeless person and how you're going to yeah, yeah, you know, uh, rescue a drone out of a tree or something is going to be virtually yeah. impossible to do. Um, so that's kind of like one route you can go down. And then the other route is kind of like more the community approach, which mm. is where um, it is a little tougher because you have to go out and set standards or, um, uh, through culture. Like and kind of tell people, hey, this is how we want the community to kind of um, to operate, yeah. and here's what we're all trying to achieve. So let's go and do this together. Um, but uh, it's just two completely different approaches. Absolutely. The we actually the guys don't know us, do they? Maybe not. They don't know us. 
when everyone registered here tonight, we actually put in a, a question, what's your most embarrassing story in business? So we actually tried to dig up some dirt on the two of you. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Oh, look at the panic on their face. <laughs> <laughs> you tell us about this. When we're behind the curtain, you're going to talk about this. No, we don't tell you guys no anything. <laughs> you went missing so like five minutes. Like 20 minutes. Yeah. 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 So everyone, there's actually a lot of people here who put up the, like, their embarrassing story. Well, it's actually pretty cool that they just admit what their embarrassing stories are. There's yeah. more to come on that in a second. But Jules, yeah. Alex, <laughs> we emailed Alex, uh, and she said to ask Jules, can she do a front roll? I can and, and have you ever got in trouble in school? I don't know what the story is behind yeah. that. Is, is it connected? We did try to <laughs> ring her to kind of explain more, but she goes, sorry, I'm at the races and, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, yeah. and I don't work Friday. Yeah. So good luck. Yeah. Um, so I, I cannot do a forward roll. Uh, it is a physical impossibility for some reason, but it was. Yeah. When, go, when did that go? Work? Come on. I'm not, uh, oh my god, you're bringing me back to PE class. Yeah. To we, actually, <laughs> like we actually have a map. <laughs> yeah, so I bring out the map. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I, growing up in school in Ireland, I was in this lovely convent school. There was sort of like a dilapidated Hogwarts of sorts run by some kindly <laughs> nuns um, who lived in the basement. It was a weird, weird setup. And, That's uh, odd. Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty odd setup. Um, and in the attic of the building, there was like the PE hall. And I used to, like, every Tuesday morning, you'd go up and if the gymnast mat was out, I'd, I'd just start getting heart palpitations and kind of cycle to the back of the queue. <laughs> while like everyone would go up and do pristine forward rolls and somersaults and I, 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 one time I tried circling back and the like, teacher noticed what I was doing and she's like, Jules, come to the front. Uh, and she tried to like push me over, she put my head down and push me over and she's like, wow, this is actually really different. I, I don't, this is, I'm not sure what's happening here, your legs. But yeah. while my entire class looked on, it really is an abiding memory of the uh, yeah, entire class. Well, I'm sorry to bring it up tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of got me sweating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I feel bad for bringing it up. Yeah. We were actually hoping that someone would send in a video, but they didn't. Yeah, oh, we're hoping um, for a follow-up. Thank God that was pre, like, phone. phone yeah. Yeah. That was good. Tim's Tim. panicking. No, yeah. I can't Tim's believe panicking. It. I, I really wish you did me first. Because now <laughs> she's not like, at the forward roll. <laughs> I'm like really that's, sweating That's the now. problem, right? We yeah. actually tried to do a little bit of research oh, on yeah, you. There's nothing, right? right? There's yeah. nothing. You're, you're the yeah. cleanest whistle well, in the world. Uh, it's like, air task it's like oh, someone went on to air task or <laughs> and went, totally could you please clean up my profile? <laughs> yeah. Right? And I will pay a thousand or a million just to clean it all up. We literally couldn't find anything. Not a thing. I, your st I, I, your I, staff, yeah. 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 someone over here. That's sure. loyalty. Yeah. No, it's real. <laughs> that well, is. We met them. We met them a couple of times because obviously we had a couple of meetings about getting you on the show. And we were kind of like, and the problem is everyone in London is quite new. Right, so Evans wrote, "No, I'm not. Yeah, no, I'm not throwing any, the fender yeah, yeah, under yeah. the bus for you guys." <laughs> we're, we're, I'm yeah. really, yeah. really grateful. That they <laughs> yeah, like, I, I was like, really "Bonuses passionate. for everybody." But if we, yeah. the forward roll was kind of like one thing, I think it could have escalated from there. <laughs> yeah. I was like, really so these charges, Tim. <laughs> stuff, but, uh, I'd say, I'm really glad you don't know. I'd say it would have been a different story if we rang Australia. Uh, possibly. Could have been. Uh, we had one, but we thought it was quite bad, so we weren't going to do it. It was just too bad. <laughs> no, and it was. It actually was. It actually yeah, was. That's just not bad. Like that, that's like just wrong. Wrong. We only met you once before. We didn't know what way it would go. You might yeah. have caught him out anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we just yeah. Said we well, I'm going to worry next time. The only, the only yeah. thing we found, I mean, actually, yeah, I'm not sure if it's up. No, it's not. The only thing we found was a ridiculously cute baby photo of you. That was it. Oh, I'm not going to like show a cute good. baby photo. What do you mean cute? Yeah, your baby was a cute baby. I was actually a child model. You were a child model. Oh, that should have yeah. been the first yeah. question yeah. on these cards. Yeah. What happened? But Where did I it all go wrong? Like, Where did I it all go wrong? It's really mean. I usually make that gag, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. It happen, but the fact that you've made that gag kind of cut me. It's one yeah. of those ones where you, where you grow out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, as Graham said, we actually ask everyone here in the audience to send in an embarrassing story. Yeah, an embarrassing story in business. Yeah, which the majority of you did. You know, the majority in fairness, of you did. a lot of you did, yeah. I actually have a microphone. Mm -hmm and a list of people that sent in. Where's Gabriel? <laughs> oh no, oh no. Gabriel, give a big round of applause for Gabriel. Gabriel, you sent in your embarrassing business story. Do you mind telling everybody? Yeah, I think I, think I remember this. Yeah, uh, you do, yeah, of course you do. Yeah, well, about uh, five, six years ago, I started a food business and uh, I, I came up with uh, uh, some amazing mushroom burgers. And then uh, to later find out that the name that I chose for them had a different meaning in another language. What, <laughs> and, uh, what was it? <laughs> I would get people coming to my store saying, uh, hey, uh, well, what's the name of it? And I say, it's the Mushi Burgers. And uh, it actually means vagina in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in German. <laughs> 
and I found out later on when I had people like giggling there. <laughs> oh, that's awkward. That's awkward. Sa Samit Patel. Where Samit Patel? Where where are you? Sam. Sam, don't you hide from me, Sam. You're embarrassing. Do you remember your one? Your embarrassing business story? You don't yeah, you do? <laughs> I'll tell it. I would want me to tell it. Sam here, at the back of the room, flew to the wrong country for a meeting. <laughs> right, just so that's yeah. yeah. What country was it? Yeah. How did you mix up countries? I think it was Birmingham somewhere, Birmingham somewhere else. Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> 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 anyway, guys. That has been the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'd like to thank our guests, Jules, and also Tim for coming on the show. I'd also like to thank everyone for tuning in on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're tuning in from. I'd also like to thank everyone here in the audience for coming along. Thank you so much. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Jobio and also Smith & Williamson. So thank you so much. Guys. Absolutely. And don't forget to give us a like on Facebook, Insta, Twitter, everywhere else. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>